<laughs> All righty. Um, what is up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the Ronnie Asani Show. Today's guest is a legend. Just and pause a, there, if you don't mind, <laughs> so the listeners can absorb a that. <laughs> a legend. A few pauses. Yeah. And a very familiar face to many people or most people in Australia. Um, and an expert on all things communication. Regina is a regular on Channel 7's uh, The Morning Show, I as am. well as Channel yeah. 9. Yeah. yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, she also has the world's most awesome name. Oh, would you think that? My mum will love you forever. <laughs> she, I hope she's watching now. <laughs> I'll make sure she does. Regina <laughs> <laughs> um, has made a living out of her ability to get her message across and is a professional media trained presenter and a media expert. Um, today, of the many things she does is uh, she's a director at the Front and Center Training Solutions, yeah. uh, which is a training organization that helps businesses through sales training, leadership training, and Many, many other things. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of things today. But first, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing really well. And what I would like to say is I'm in an extraordinary place with your new Thank studio. You. It looks fantastic. Appreciate um, that. And it's a delight to be here. Meeting you, you're the legend. Thank I'm just you. a sidekick. Oh, no, don't ever say that. <laughs> I feel like I'm way out of my league. <laughs> you're so in your league. And I tell you what, after today, everybody that listens will have yeah. the same tips and hints that we have. And they'll be legends like us. I, so I, I hope stick so. Stick around. Don't yep. stop listening. Absolutely. <laughs> what is up, everyone? This is Ronnie, your host of the Ronnie Asani Show. My number one goal in this show is to bring you some of the most amazing and accomplished individuals in the business world to share with you some real, raw, and authentic business insights. We sit down and talk in a casual setting, nothing too serious, yet we unpack some of the most incredible ideas, concepts, and best practices. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh, and don't forget to share the love. Like, share, and subscribe. Gracias, amigos. So, obviously, you are uh, you spend a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of years um, mastering the craft of communication. So that will be one of the things that we'll touch on a lot today. Right. Um, we'll go a little bit through leadership as well. Mm. Um, maybe if we're feeling, go a little bit into sales. Oh, I love sure. sales. You love sales. I you love, love it sales. all. Mm. What is what is like your most favorite? Like if you had to do one thing, because uh, you do twenty things. But yeah. what if you had to do one thing? Mm. What would you do? What would be that? I th I think communication underpins everything. It right. underpins the way you sell. It underpins yep. the way you lead, and it underpins life. It underpins every relationship, every family interaction, every phone call, every text message. So I, I love communication because yeah. it then gives me the breadth of being able to do all the other things that I love as much. Yep, yep. Because mm. I guess like when you sell, like a lot of salespeople say that, they say um, you don't only sell in business, you don't only sell like, you know, if you're trying to pitch something, you're selling to, you know, your partner, you're selling mm. to your kids, you know, yeah. you were talking about your, your daughter earlier, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, my 25-year-old one. But I'm still out. looking for, yeah, shout out to Jamie Lee Fechner. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess communication is definitely that too. Like, mm. you know, you use it in every single thing. Um, so I guess before we jump into communication, mm. I had a, um, I had this thought today, which is, you know, every year there's like every year or maybe every few years, the, you always have all these new skills coming up. Like, yeah, you, you know, technology makes certain things, uh, I guess, more obsolete or less relevant and makes other things. Mm. Uh, much more relevant. But the one thing that never changes is obviously communication. Yeah. Um, but from your experience and obviously working with uh, different organizations and throughout all the different experiences you've had, what do you think moving into 2021 mm. and next couple of years are the most important skills people need to have? Yeah, well, I think coming through a time that was 2020, which is something the world has never seen, yeah. um, communication was all of a sudden lost. We stopped communicating by going out with people. We stopped communicating by having office hub meetings. We stopped communicating, you know, face to face. Everything became the virtual world. Yeah. So I think going into 2021, we've got to come up with a whole lot of empathy yep. within our organisations because what people have been through last yep. year is something that we'll never see again yep. and the recovery from that is going to be huge. So listening skills and empathy is going to be the key to our success moving forward if we want to lead people and lead a generation of communicators that can still communicate yep. effectively. 
how do you have empathy? Yeah. Like, what if I don't like, you know, yeah, like, I don't want to sound like an, <laughs> like an asshole, but like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things I feel like is not necessarily, some people might say it's not necessarily a skill. It's something you're born with, but I'm sure there's, there are ways that you can cultivate more empathy. Yeah, you can learn anything if you want. People yeah. say to me, I don't know how to remember names. Now, the yeah. only reason they don't know how to remember a name is because they don't care enough to want to remember a name, right? right? So people say to me all the time, well, I'm just not empathetic. It's yeah. like, just like me or don't, whatever. Yeah. Well, if you are a leader or if you are in touch with people yeah. and leading teams of human beings, yeah. you learn empathy. And it doesn't. it has to still be genuine. It has to be authentic. It has to be yeah. real, raw, emotive and engaging. But if you think to yourself, I don't really have it, but I genuinely want to be a great leader and you learn it, the skills of empathy are really simple. It's all mm. about understanding someone else's world. It's all about listening. Mm. It's all about just acknowledging that someone's having a really crap day and that's okay. So yeah. you can learn those skills, but you have to want to want to do it. Yeah. So if you want to want to learn someone's name, you can learn to do it. If you want to yeah. want to learn empathy, you can absolutely do it. Just have to care. Just care, care and but <laughs> genuinely care. Go like you know what? I've got a team of great humans here, and I want to care. Now that doesn't mean you've got to invite them over for a barbecue every day, or you've got to ask yeah. them every day how their weekend was, or look at their baby photos. Yeah. What it does mean though is that you use your manners around them mm. and you're polite. So you use their name and you say good morning when you walk yep. into the office. And if you see that someone is sad at their desk, mm. you make the effort to make sure that they're okay. Yep. You don't have to fix it. You just have to go over and make sure that they're okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess the other side of the coin is um, how do you communicate that empathy? Because you don't necessarily like show empathy just by having it, right? Oh, like you, you've got you've to communicate <laughs> it and something <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I've got do. empathy. Yeah, I've got empathy, <laughs> so just trust me, Grace. No, yeah. no, you do so, have to show it. And, and people receive um, your messages in different ways. Some yeah. people, I guess, introverts, extroverts, different communication mm -hmm. styles. So mm -hmm. it's about also how you communicate that empathy. Yeah. And that's even also about your tone, yeah. inflection, diction, articulation, yeah. pause and pace. The way you ask someone how they are, not just, yeah, how are you going? How are you? Mm. And I'm asking how you are. Mm. Talk to me. Uh, your body language communicates empathy. If you walk yep. in and your arms are crossed are like, oh, here we go again and rolling your eyes, mm. what's wrong this time? Now, that does not look or sound empathetic. Yep. Just undoing your arms and not rolling your eyes is communicating empathy. I am here if you need to talk to me. Yep. I'm just down the corridor. Absolutely. Mm. And I think it, it kind of ties with uh, emotional intelligence. Mm. So, you know, given like having empathy is one of those things where it's a balance of like how much do I give mm. versus also I got to look after myself, yeah. right? So if, if I'm always going to be empathetic and, mm. you know, worry about how other people feel, when am I going to have time to worry about how I feel, <laughs> right? Yeah. So so I've, I feel like it ties with emotional intelligence, understanding also where I feel um, and w at what point do I need to to be looked after or to have me time or even talk to my therapist or my yeah. coach or whatever um so that you can still have enough room and 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 um stock if you will of empathy to give other people that's really important you do have to look after yourself because you're no good to anybody if yeah. you're not good yourself so we always talk to leaders and say if you're not getting the right time that you need you can't lead an effective team yeah um, and emotional intelligence and all of that stuff is i have to also understand how my behavior mm. affects others so when i walk into a room i love a good hug and a kiss right yeah. I'm, so i'm struggling in the COVID space because hugging and kissing has become my pastime uh, and yeah. what's extraordinary about that is if i walk into a room and i know that you don't want to hug and kiss me mm. i go running up and hugging and kissing you where's that emotional intelligence you're mm. backing away i'm moving forward and chasing you for that hug and a kiss yeah, uh, that person will end up in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get that. Will, and our interactions for the next while we're together will right. be really awkward and uncomfortable. So emotional intelligence is all about how am I feeling, but also how does my behaviour affect others? Yep. And a really important part, and I say this all the time to leaders, mm. is impact yep. versus intent. Yep. So my intent of me hugging and kissing you Yep. might be because I want you to feel comfortable and know that everything's going to be okay. Yep. But the impact that has on you is you're scared out of your wits and you think, I want you. Which, right. you know, I might do. No, don't, yeah. no, everyone out there, I don't. I don't. But what I'm saying is that yeah. intent versus impact. So my intentions are really good is making you feel safe because I'm hugging you and kissing you. 
and my emotional intelligence should realise that you don't want that. Exactly. But what my intent saying is, if I do this, you're going to feel comfortable. But the impact that has on you is the absolute opposite. It backfires. It backfires. Yeah. And that's no different to if I might say to a friend, I didn't invite you to the party because I know you don't like my friends that are coming. Yep. My intention is I don't want to put you in a space that makes you feel uncomfortable. But the impact that has on the person I did it to is, Grizz didn't invite me. So the party, I feel really left out and have I heard her and have I upset her? So that then leads on to a whole lot of other ramifications. So we've got to be mindful that emotional intelligence is so important Mm. as is understanding how your behaviour affects others. And even though you think the intention is good, the impact might be very different for somebody else. Yeah, and I I think it's it's not only your actions, but, Mm. you know, what you say. So Mm -hmm. I try to, you know, personally, trying to be more emotionally intelligent, I always try to whenever i go into a meeting or sitting out sitting with different people even hanging out at a cafe or whatever the context may be look at people's facial expressions mm-hmm. and how they react mm-hmm. as you use certain words because certain words have different and 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 you know maybe maybe even topics have different uh impact like you said mm-hmm. and effects on on people in different ways so maybe next time don't don't talk about yeah. You know, uh, politics. American politics, because, <laughs> you know, yeah. your friend uh, James gets really wired up, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, And even the COVID vaccination. You mm. know, I was in an environment uh, last week at a conference and I was sitting having lunch with people and they started talking about it and you could just see the body language change with one of these particular yeah. person and the other person kept on and on and on about it and I just thought, read the body language, buddy. Read just it. read what's going on. This isn't the place all the time to talk about who's being vaccinated and who's not and that then makes everyone else feel uncomfortable around them and it mm. changes the whole environment. So yep. body language is key to your success and we talk about that, you know, visually. Your body says so much more mm. than your words. Words will ever speak. So if you are not tuned into someone's body language, you really don't have a clue what's going on. Because mm. I might say, gee whiz, I'm having a really good time. Mm. Now, I'm saying the word you want to hear, but my body language does not reflect that at all. And nor does my tonality in my voice. Yep. So it's really important. So that all takes us to listening, right? Because if yeah. you're listening and if you're projecting um, your senses onto people, like you're trying to really see and listen and uh, the tone of voice Mm, mm. all these different aspects rather than just being focused on what you're saying yeah yeah right yeah listen to learn yeah listen to engage and listen to understand beautiful yeah see i can sum that up really quickly listening is key to your success if you were to ask me and i'm sure it might be one of your questions but what's the most important communication skill yep it's absolutely listening. Listening. Because without listening, you can't do anything else. You know, we'll yep. talk about all the other skills, uh, but listening to learn, listen to understand, and listen to engage. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I was trying to listen as you were telling me this. <laughs> yeah, I've got a whole lot of stuff. You keep listening, take some <laughs> notes, whatever you need to do. Uh, but listening is really good. And listening just to be there in the moment. And that means not looking at your phone. Yep. You are not listening to someone if you're looking at the phone. You're not listening to somebody if you're looking on what's going around you. To intently listen, it means you genuinely, I'm actually opening mm. up my ears. And I'm listening to everything you've got to say. And when your friends or even your boss or anyone, your parents or whatever are talking to you, mm. just not look at your phone because people look at don't understand phone. how negatively impactful that is. Like it, it really annoys a lot of people, but, you know, they might not say anything to you, mm. but they just feel unlistened, unheard, you know. So anyway, um, I think... Even when you're talking to your mother, mm. uh, don't go through your Instagram. I do that. I used to do that. Yep. Sorry, mum. And uh, it's really bad because you start looking at Instagram and I couldn't tell you what she'd mm-hmm. said for the last five minutes. Yep. And that's not a conversation. And if right. you want to have a conversation, put down your phone and genuinely listen. Maybe give a, even give them less time. So yeah. if you were to spend maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, if you spend five minutes, mm. only five minutes, but yep. really like listening mm. to them, yeah. it, it makes a lot uh, more difference. Um I think creativity, just speaking about like the skills uh, that are really important moving forward, I think creativity is really important. Um, besides all this, like the suite of um, listening and communication skills, I think creativity is. And if you think about it, creativity, part of it is, is communication, it's isn't it? It's communication, it's being curious. And even, I talk about when you have someone at hello, you've got 15 to 30 seconds yep. for someone to decide if they want to listen to you or not. Yep. So if you don't get that bit right, doesn't matter how good your questioning capabilities are. It doesn't matter how good you're handling any concerns or objections. Having people at hello is really important. So mm. how do you do that creatively? 
yep. even on an email because so many emails come through on people press delete so many people yep. on dms whatever it is if you are not creative in those early moments you know mm. men are from mars women are from venus that was a yep. book um and it sold millions and millions of copies but it was so wasn't i never read it <laughs> Do you know what though? It used to be called What Your Father Couldn't Tell You and Your Mother Didn't Know. Mm. No one bought the book because it wasn't creative. The title wasn't creative, right? Mm. So you bring on this amazing creative title, a creative headline. We do it in the media all the time. We talk about headlining. Yep. Headlining for impact. And it's all about creative and, and word moving so that people go, oh, I've got to buy that magazine or I want to watch that new show or yeah. I want to see, oh my gosh, Shane Wan and Liz Hurley got married. And you're like, far out, I'm going to keep on network to watch the show because that was a creative way of getting us bought in. So creativity and communication goes hand in hand. And the more creative Absolutely. you are when you speak, the more people want to listen. And the more yep. good you are at telling stories, yep. people want to listen because, you know, we're born around storytelling when we're born out of our mums the first yep. thing people do is tell us stories we sit yep. around campfires and have stories and stories connect to our heart and they're emo- oh, i'm getting quite worked up because i do love a good uh, story go for it um, go for it and i love because stories are creative <laughs> yeah so when you yep. bring all of that back to your initial assumption of going you know yeah communication is pretty creative 100 percent, hands down the most creative form of communication is the best form of communication 100 percent. Mm. it's 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 finding Interesting ways and effective ways to communicate mm. an idea yeah. uh, that hasn't been communicated before, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many different ways you can do that. You know, no yeah. more is it, you know, you might send a little teaser with something to communicate the start of a message. Or even if you're going to a meeting, yeah. sending your boss, you know, one slide of the pitch that you're about to pitch and say, this is what it is. And it might be some random funny picture. And then caption it with, it's about to go down. It's about, exactly. <laughs> but that's the stuff is, you know, have these moments in time, um, yeah. 15 to 30 seconds is what someone's going to look at you or listen to you for. Make it creative, make it real yeah. and make people laugh. You know, we talk about humour is yeah. the very best medicine and, yeah. um, you know, kids 437 times a day laugh. Yep. Adults know more than about 15. Yep. Yep. Now, if you can create humour in your creative message delivery and communication, people are going to want to buy in because laughter creates dopamine in your brain. Absolutely. And it's like this neon light that says, keep on talking to me because I'm loving this interaction. Yep. So the minute people laugh and they smile, dopamine and endorphins hit your brain and you want to hang out with that person again. Yes. So even in Absolutely. the sales environment or the leadership environment, if you've got a leader that's funny and engages humour, you want to hang out with them because the dopamine says, I want to be around this person, I'm feeling good. In a sales environment, you've had a meeting, you've made them laugh. They they see your name in the appointment book to come back to pitch and they're like that name and the dopamine just starts creating in their brain even though you haven't said anything because last time they felt good i'd love to see i don't know if there's any study out there to mm. back what we're saying because i truly believe in mm. what we're saying but there's um i'd love to things. yeah i'd love to see like some sort of a study that shows correlation between sense of humor mm. and and success in career and 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 income because mm. I feel like the more, like you said, if if you're if you got humor, if you know how to communicate in interesting ways and get that dopamine out of mm. people, um, it's only going to reflect in one way. It's going to push you upwards. Yeah, yeah. Well, as Andrew Denton says, don't be afraid to be funny. Dot dot dot, and don't be afraid not to. Yeah. Um, there's amazing study and there's a, um, a brilliant TED talk. Um, Dr. Sean Acor on TED talk. He talks about the happiness advantage, and he suggests that if you can put your brain in the positive space, his happiness will make you successful. Mm-hmm. Successful won't make you happy. And the data around it, it's not just you and I talking about pretend mm. grizz stuff. The data around it suggests that if you're in the happiness advantage, now that doesn't mean that you've got to run, it, run around every day going, oh my God, I'm happy, I can sell. But if your brain thinks happy and finds that happy space, because our brains are wired and we have a lens through which we work through. Mm. And that lens at the moment, every time you put your phone on, it's negative news, negative, negative. Mm. So your brain looks for negative it can't see positive because there's nothing positive flashing anywhere around it. Yep. So what I say to people when I coach them in this space about becoming happy is three things a day to write down the things that you're grateful for. And the first mm. time day you'll go, I don't know, nothing. It was a really crappy day. Everything was hard and no one rang me back and my emails weren't returned and all this stuff. And I might say, well, happy was you had a really good coffee that your barista mm. knew the name and made it. So each day those things get easier and after 21 days – your brain starts to focus on positive. It doesn't Mm. look for the negative anymore. Now, what the data suggests is your sales will increase 39% higher if your brain is in the happiness space. Doctors diagnose and prescribe 19% more effectively if they're in the happiness space. Now, I would want a doctor that was in the happiness zone if they were consulting me with a diagnosis, Mm. right? Um, You talk about uh, promotion. I mean, the study is phenomenal and Dr. Sean Aker, the happiness advantage, is absolutely talking about how you can turn uh, your happiness into success and money and sales and 
all the stuff that you speak about. So, you know, it's not me just sitting here going, be happy. The data behind it suggests, and there was another extraordinary nun study. And what nun. happened? The nun study. Wow, okay, mm. interesting. See, you want data? You think yeah, I'm blonde? I'm giving you data, buddy. Hey, don't <laughs> put words in my mouth. I didn't say nothing. Just for those listeners out there, I do look blonde and who would think that I could provide data? But this data is really good. So it's called the Nun Study and yeah. at the age of – we weren't even talking about this, so I've just <laughs> yeah. totally gone off on the tangent. Oh, sure. Um, but the Nun Study, at the age of 22, yep. 180 nuns went into a convent. Right. And they had to write a journal before they went in about how they felt. Had they had a good life? Had they had a crappy life? What was their excitement or non-excitement of going to this convent? Mm. Now, what was extraordinary out of those 180 nuns, the people that wrote, they were really happy and had a really good life and were positive and the world was so exciting and they were so privileged to be going to this convent, they lived, 85% of them lived over 85 years old and, you know, the rest of them still lived at 95. What was extraordinary about this study was the ones that weren't happy, they died much Hmm. more early, but they then were donating their brains to science because what we wanted to look at was what did their brains show at the age of 95 in the happy place. Mm. Now, their brains were riddled with dementia and advanced dementia and advanced disease and Parkinson's disease. So their brains were riddled with it, yet you would never have known they had dementia. They were doing everything normally. They were perfectly healthy. So their brains had the medical disease, but because they had this happiness component and they saw good things happen, the disease never shone through to a physical. Interesting. Extraordinary, I reckon. Wow, so, that, so, so they had... The, 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 the diseases the disease. ha- like mm. had developed in the yeah. brains, yeah. but we're not showing not on a day to day basis because the happiness out. was. Yep. yep. Wow. Okay. That's a What's, good summary. What was the name of the study? The nun study. The nun study. Yeah. The nun okay. study. Mm. Got to look that up. Got to look it up. For anyone listening, check check it out <laughs> check just it to out. make sure Grizz is not uh, lying <laughs> I'm to us. I'm not lying to you. I'll quickly go home and write a nun study now. There are 180 people and they did this and did that. Uh, there's a lot more to it, obviously. Of course. But the data around it again suggests that the nuns that wrote at the age of 22 that were happy yep. lived longer, mm-hmm. had diseased, riddled brains, yet you couldn't tell, and yep. their life was good. Mm. Now, I'm not saying every day you've got to be happy, right? Please don't leave here going, oh, yeah. just wants to be happy. Uh, what I want you to think about, though, is being optimistic and finding a light. So look for the light. Might yep. be happy days every day. And, and do what works for you because I don't think uh, there's a specific way no. that makes everyone happy, no. right? Like, mm. you know, so I, I know some people who like to shut off social media. Yeah. Um, a lot. I tend to, I, I had that problem back in the day where being on social media, obviously I'm a marketer by, by trade. So um, if I shut myself off sh- social media, <laughs> I don't have a job. Um, you don't. But, but you, you've got to find uh, ways that work for you. And some people choose to be off because there's all these things that are hammering you every day, yeah. you know, showing you. Uh, what other people are doing, how other people are better uh, than you, living the life, uh, all that stuff. You know, if, if you can manage to um, go through your day without letting the external and, and like uh, developing a calluses, yeah. if you will, yeah. um, then I guess your happiness is going gonna, is gonna to go up uh, mm-hmm. steadily. And remember, happiness breeds success. Yeah. The other way around. If you are happy, you are going to be more successful. Mm. And the da- there's a lot of data, again, the Sean Acor stuff on the happiness advantage um, and heaps of it. So it's not just you and I talking about it. Mm. The data suggests if you are happy, you will be more successful. Happiness brings success. You know, I like you a lot because you, you, you talk in terms of data and I'm a data person <laughs> as well. Oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Lucky I've got <laughs> some in my head because I want to talk about fashion and clothes. <laughs> That's You're got losing. no data behind <laughs> <Look at> it. <laughs> 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 All right, so that's awesome. So um, let's talk about... Uh, effective communication skills in in the workplace and mm. on a personal level if i guess the starting point for anyone um is how do i know where i stand mm. uh, i guess there's a lot of different assessment tools out there you know you could also talk to you know a coach or you know yeah. an expert like you that yeah. will tell you right off the bat use <laughs> no, <I didn't> <laughs> <say that. laughs> um i'm but, tough no, yeah <laughs> tough love yeah. and um and then from there Okay, what are the weaknesses, what are the strengths, and how do I go about them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, you've got to be open to feedback. So, mm. you know, everyone goes, oh, I don't know what to do to be better, I don't know. And then we offer feedback, and they choose not to take it, because mm. then they feel really um, cranky that you've given them feedback. Mm. I think the most unreal people in the whole wide world ask for feedback, mm. look for feedback, and then act on the feedback. And it's the way you deliver feedback. So I think 
when you want to know where you stand, the first point is having the guts to ask for feedback. Mm. The second point is sitting down in the meeting and listening to the feedback and not becoming defensive. Mm. Because quite often we get really defensive, me included, mm. you know. Yep. Oh, Grizz, you spoke too fast in that. or you did, And I'm like, well, what? I was just excited and I start on and I, hang on a moment, you know what? I did speak fast and mm. I'm really going to make a conscious effort because I want the listeners or the viewers to be able to take on board what I'm saying. So yep. if that means I learn to speak slower, yay me. Yep. Um, so it's turning the feedback into something to go, I'm doing this to be the very best I can be. Mm. And if I can be the very best, I'm going to feel good and I'm going to change people's lives. And yep. that's cool. So it's, you know, first of all, I want the feedback. I'm not going to be cranky at the feedback and I'm going to work out how to respond and act on the feedback. And that'll yep. put me in a better spot. With the feedback, it's, mm. um, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one because sometimes when people give you feedback... Mm. Uh, not every time. A lot of times the feedback is true. Mm. So it's the battle of truth. It so is. sometimes people will give you feedback and they're absolutely wrong. 100%. But a lot of times it will be true. Mm. So regardless of what the f- if the feedback is true or not, how do, you, how do you take it? So let's say someone said, look, I don't think, you know, you, you've been working hard lately, right? Yeah. So maybe you haven't. But also maybe you have been working hard, but uh, they just didn't see it. Yeah. So it's still a feedback, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. you take you take that on board and you say, okay, well, how do I make sure that they see that? Yep. Right? So at the end of the day, there's no way, or you, you should never be defensive, but you should also not take every feedback as, you know, like take a face value and just be like, yeah, yeah that's true, okay. No, sometimes they're not right. So you have to also know when... To, to 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 tell when people are not right with the feedback they're giving you, but still not get defensive about it. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's really Im- important. I think that I would question more. So mm. when I ask for the feedback, if you said to me, oh, you know, Grizz, you're not really working that hard at the moment, are you? Mm. I'd say, Ronnie, I'm really sad that you think that. Give me some examples mm. as to why you're saying that. Why yeah. why am I giving getting this feedback? Because in my head... I've got a hundred things of going, I've been really busy, I've been out on site, I've been on location, I've been doing this, I've been... So until you actually can question further, so I always use the ACT principle when I'm asking for feedback from Mm. somebody. So the ACT principle is acknowledge what you say. Ronnie, I really appreciate what you've said about you think I'm not working that Mm. much at the moment. Yep. So that's the A. The next person C for the ACT model is clarify with further questions. When you say I'm not working hard, is that because I'm not responding to your emails at 12 o'clock at night or is that because you don't see me in the office at 8 in the morning? Help me understand what you see Mm. of me at the moment. Then once you hear the answers, talk and tell your response. Yep. So acknowledge them, clarify with further questions, talk and tell your response. And that way you're not just going, okay, because they'll be able to – you'll be able to work out very quickly how valid the feedback is or not by the questions that you're asking them. Absolutely. Yeah. And people are really bad at giving feedback. You know, yeah. this is probably the biggest thing I coach in a business mm. is talking to leaders about how to give feedback because I talk to them about giving them the SBI model, which is, again, data-focused, mm. the situation, the behaviour and the impact. Mm. So, Grizz, this was the situation. For the last week, everyone's in the office at 8 and you're coming in at 10 o'clock. Yep. So, that's it. SBI model, the behaviour, yep. and the behaviour is everyone thinks that you're not working. Mm. They're in here dropping kids off at daycare at 7 and you just walk on in at 10 o'clock. The yep. impact that has on the team is that you're not doing the work, what's going on. Mm. So giving me the situation, the behaviour and the impact is much more true to feedback yep. than just saying, oh, why aren't you working much lately? Mm. That doesn't give me clarity or context. Yeah. Amazing. Really? Yeah, I've, I've learned so much. <laughs> Love yeah, the SBI. As, as your listeners are SBI situation behavior impact this was a situation this is how you behaved and this is the impact beautiful right we can sign off now no we've got so much more to chat about we've got so much more (laughs) have we uh I believe so we're only 30 minutes in depending on how much time you have I've got all the time in the world beautiful um Cool. Let's talk about negotiation. For oh. all the entrepreneurs out there, yeah. the number one skill you need yeah. to have is <laughs> negotiation. Yeah. You're gonna negotiate every single thing from the office rent <laughs> to <laughs> to uh, equity in your business with investors to suppliers, vendors, literally with your partner to get five yes. more hours to work on your business. <laughs> right? or, or take them shopping, five more hours to get that dress. Go back to shopping again. Yeah. I'll get you third at the end. Negotiation is the mother of all skills, I it think. Is. Yeah, it absolutely is. How do you negotiate? 
How yeah. do you become a, a master negotiator? Yeah, it's all about preparation. When I do negotiation skills training, the most amount of time I spend on training is the preparation of the negotiation. Right. Because you cannot just walk into anywhere willy-nilly, whether it's asking for a pay rise or asking for five more hours to work on your business or asking for you know, anything, a, a new role, without knowing exactly what you want. Knowledge is power. And mm. I say that from, again, a communication perspective. If you've got knowledge, you can speak from the heart. Yep. So you and I today, n- we, neither of us have got notes. Mm. We're no. talking from the heart yep. because we've got knowledge. Yep. Now imagine if I'd come in as one of your speakers yep. and I didn't actually have knowledge. It would yep. be a really tough interview, yeah? Yeah, I'd have to do the whole show You'd myself. You'd have to do the whole show yourself and I'd just be sitting here smiling, looking pretty, right? Yep. right with yep. the right angles. Getting my yeah, arms yeah, you even right came angles. with that, I prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so that preparation is key to your success. So in a negotiation, you've got to know what your lowest point is. Yep. If you're going for a pay rise and you want a 20% uh, and they give you 5%, are you going to walk away with that or are you going to walk away? Going in prepared is key, number one. Mm-hmm. Number two is what's a win-win because that's what you want the outcome to be is I feel good walking out of the situation and my employer or my husband or my wife whoever, or whoever yeah. walks away feeling like they've also won. Yep. Part of negotiation is also being prepared to walk away. And right. that's the biggest tip that I can give someone. If you are not happy, it's okay to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to walk away and think about this. Mm. Walking away doesn't mean walking away forever. It means walking away at that moment in time. Mm. And I get really cranky when people, if someone rings me and they want me to do something straight away, I'll often say, let me go home and look at my diary. Right. Because I want time to think about it. Mm-hmm. I want time to make sure that I'm the right person for the job. And I want time to understand what how that impacts my team or my family. If I've got yep. to go away to the Bahamas, yeah. that would be very hard to negotiate. Well, I wouldn't want to go. Um, if I'm going away to the Bahamas, I need to think about it. So I always say to somebody, I'll come back to you within the hour. And that gives me time to go away and think about what I want, what I need, what my family needs, like all of that stuff. Mm. So don't say yes straight away unless yep. you get what you want. Yep. straight away so yep. walk away points are important mm. preparation is the key to your success yep. and knowing that your lowest um what your lowest will the, go the lowest the level lowest that you're gonna go to you're gonna go to otherwise you're gonna be cranky with yourself forever yeah i feel like walking away is probably i guess it's hard to say but if not the most it's one of the most important things because if they sense that you're you're there and you're not gonna walk away without something yeah. they'll keep pressing of course they will. they'll keep pressing to get they whatever they want yeah they know you're stuck in there exactly um so and, and it, walking away is one of those things that are hard to fake yeah it is very hard to fake yeah. um unless like you're harvey from suits right <laughs> uh, i want to be him I, yeah. i'd be happy to be in that program with him and be the rachel i, I reckon you would have you would have made a, a <laughs> very good rachel um yeah and now she's married to harry where's that left me <laughs> uh, well season 10 you're going there um yeah so Walking away is super important. I like the fa- I like talking about like preparing first, because um, even for me, I used to think that negotiation is about like how you close people in the middle of the the the, the negotiation or the conversation. It's actually preparing all these different options. So yeah. the more options you have prior to going in, yeah. the more leverage you have. So it's all like 90% is the dirty work outside the the negotiation room. Yep. Yeah. Which is pretty awesome. It's really awesome. And also remember if they say no, and I say this to people all the time, no just means no right now. Mm. No does not mean no forever. So they might you might walk out and go, right, we can't come to an agreement today. Mm. And that's okay because what about even a week's time? Yep. They've done their research, they've gone to market and realised that you are the best person for the job mm. and they don't want to lose you and to find a new person to go at recruiting costs and all that's going to be more than the pay rise you've asked for, they might come back. So when someone says no, don't be disheartened. Just say to your m- own brain, it's only no for this moment in time, it's not mm. no forever. Funny you say that because um, one of the jobs I had back in the day, yeah. I negotiated a salary increase a week in after getting the job. <laughs> They hated me, oh but my gosh. the reason I negotiated is I got an offer two days after I accepted, and I felt like, oh man, I I'm worth a lot more than I thought. So I went. I was like, hey, this is the situation. Being complete transparent, yeah. um, I still want to stay here because I love the culture. I love I love you guys, blah blah. blah. But um, would you consider an increase? And they gave me the increase. Um, and then three months later, I asked for another one. <laughs> You should be and teaching me negotiation. I'm going to send all my negotiation programs to you. <laughs> I didn't get the second one. 
<laughs> it was to the managing director and he looked at me he's like ronnie do you know how many times i ask for a salary increase <laughs> every day do i get it no but i keep asking so keep asking <laughs> good on him <laughs> yeah. and good on you for yeah. asking you know ask i always say to people if you don't ask you won't get yeah yeah you know and in sales or negotiation or anywhere if you don't ask you don't get people aren't absolutely mind readers. and if you ask the way you ask mm. Is very, very, if you do it well and you do it right and you're prepared and you give reason. And, you know, going into a salary review, for example, if you just walk in and go, I just want to pay rise, mm. go in with a business case, go in with all the things that you've achieved, go in with the return on investment that you have delivered on, go in and sell yourself yep. to everything you've done. And if you go in prepared and you go in with a business case, you're more likely to walk out with something than just going in going, oh, I just want to pay rise because I just do. Yep. You know, you're not going to get one for just doing. Um, but also know your value and don't be arrogant. Mm. You know, I'm the most unarrogant person in the whole wide world. And it's a privilege to even be here with you today. Every Thank opportunity you. for me is an absolute privilege. And I take it with an absolute, you know, full heart of respect. Yep. And I think I am the luckiest girl in the world. Mm. Uh, and I work really hard. And if you work hard and you're not arrogant, you will get to wherever you want to go. Yep. Do your research. So before mm. you go into, uh, you know into the room with your boss and say, hey, I want 10% or whatever. Know what anyone, everyone else who's doing the same job uh, with the same quality, same outcomes have delivered, yeah. you know, what you've delivered and where they're at yeah. and ask for 10% more. That's right. <laughs> Just, you know, with that preparation, then if you have to bargain a bit, that's okay. Yeah. You know, but know your lowest walk away point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Oh, I'm just, yeah. I want to say something on, police, on negotiation because sure. I talk to the police a lot. Um, we do a lot of stuff with the police and yep. how they negotiate with people. Yep. And often people say in a negotiation, treat others how you would want to be treated. Mm. And what the police always say and what I say is treat others how they want to be treated. Right. So if you've got someone about to jump off the Harbour Bridge and me, I like to be treated with love and warmth and you know laughter yep. and engagement, but that person up there is a real direct, straight to the point, data-driven guy... Mm. I can't treat him going, when you get down here, we're all going to give you a big hug. Because yep. that's not going to float his boat, right? Mm. What's going to float his boat is when he gets down here, the data that suggests that this is what's making him success. All that stuff, obviously the background knowledge. Um, but I just want to make the point that when you're negotiating, always negotiate to the other person's style, not yours. Treat others how they want to be treated, not how you want to be treated. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, you just can like you off. wouldn't go into a meeting ah. and, and meet like an introvert for the first time or the second oh, time no. mm. and go straight to the conversation. They want to warm up. They do. They want to get to know you. They want to know who's like, who who am I going to be talking to? Like, uh, but an extrovert just want to get to business. Like, tell me, like, let's go for it. Yeah. Um, so that, that is a really cool in general, like in terms of negotiation, um, a cool, a bunch of nice tips because I find a lot of people and I talk to people who work for companies, um, they negotiating a salary is always like a sticky point yeah. and a lot of people have that uh i guess i don't know what what do you call it but it's something that holds them back yeah. from you know whether it's uh just not knowing or not believing or having that you know um level of self-belief that like i'm worthy of to that point and, and going after it. Some people are different. Some people just <laughs> like me. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> go in and ask for a salary pay rise two days after you start, then three months after. Or fire me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's cool. Thank you for sharing your Surely tips on that. Um, tough conversations. I find mm. tough conversations a very interesting area, whether it's at home. Mm. And, and it kind of also like, overlaps with negotiation but i feel like it's a little bit different right tough conversations is i think of it as um let's say someone at work is um doing something that's bothering you just yeah. a very simple example yeah okay okay yeah. you need to put them in the place yeah. but the problem is there are a few things at stake you don't want to just ruin the relationship or you don't want to like cause any dramas or like any of the damage that can come with having the tough conversation mm. so do you find that topic interesting or no really interesting Let's and go everyone for it. yeah and we talk about it a lot actually in the media because yeah. everyone's having tough conversations at home with their parents with their families you know everyone has tough conversations mm. 
And using your example at work, the first thing I say, if ever you have to have a tough conversation at work, do not do it in the cafeteria. Do not do it in open work plan. You know, that is my number one rule. Mm. Any tough conversation should be given thought and respect for the environment that it's in. Mm. Uh, And I think that what we need to do at work as well is ensure that we don't make angst of the tough conversation. So if you're worried about the conversation and you get angsty about it, to begin with, it shouldn't be a tough conversation. Mm. Tough conversations happen because they've been let go too long. So if someone upsets you at work early on, the earlier you can chat to them about it, there's no tough conversation. Yep. If something happens at home and you let it go on and on and it builds on, up. it builds up to the tough conversation. So my even number one tip before finding the space to have it, the first tip is don't let it ever get to a tough conversation. If, yeah. if someone's upsetting you at work, don't race to HR and say, I'm going to job you into HR and I'm going to tell all the teammates. Do not tell other people about an mm. angst you've got with someone else at work. So a couple of tips already. Mm. Don't talk to others in the workplace about it, an mm. issue that you're having with your friend at work. Mm. Don't talk about it in a public place. So at lunch, if everyone's sitting around, don't go, and by the way, you really pissed me off when you did this or you really upset me when you... No. Mm. What you need to do is go into a room and, and say to the person... I know that things are a bit awkward at the moment and I really don't want it to be like that. And I can imagine you're mm. feeling like I'm feeling. Let's mm. chat about it. Mm. And then use the SBI model, the situation, the behaviour and the impact. Mm. That's the best model for any tough situation. This is how I feel, the situation. This was your behaviour in that. Now, it might be um, I was doing a presentation and you're on your tel- on your phone, on your mobile phone. And every time I do a presentation, you're in my team and you're on the phone and it really upsets me. So instead of me saying to you, I get so shitty you're on your phone all the time, in the presentation last week, the situation was we were in a presentation last week. Yep. Your behaviour was that you were on the phone constantly and I felt like you don't value what I bring to the team. The impact that has on me is I've lost my confidence and I don't want to present anymore. Yep. Now, if I was having that tough conversation with you, you'd be like, oh my God, I had no idea that it affected you so much. Yep. I'm so sorry. If it's a home conversation with your husband, your friend, your, your husband, he gets home mm. late every single night. The situation is and I'm using Dean, no pseudo name, this is my husband, Dean, for the last yep. five nights, you've been getting home after eight and the kids are already in bed. That behaviour makes me really cranky. So when you get home, you don't want to be here because I'm just angry at you. Mm. And the impact that has is that you and I fight, we don't eat dinner together anymore and the kids wake up and we go along to the next day. Mm. You're like, I had no idea that me getting home at eight for five nights in a row had impact on you. I find... Uh like not letting it build up is super powerful because yeah. a lot of people, uh, including myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a like I used to do this a lot, uh, not doing anything about it. <laughs> let it's gonna go away. Just let go. It, it just it just makes let it, it build up because it it's really bothering does. you. Come on, face it, it's bothering you. Of course it is. And not doing anything about it is is making it even worse. And and uh, you create that beast. And then by the time you. Uh, develop the, I don't know, like you, you decide to take an action and, and go and, and confront that person or talk to them. Uh, it's for you, it's the weight that it has on yeah. you is way much more yeah. than um, to the other person. So you're already going yeah. agitated, <laughs> all built up, and that person's like, holy cow, yeah. like I didn't know that no. bothered you so much when if you had addressed it, That's you know, it. back then, yeah that weight would have been, and that would have made the conversation pretty much easier. So easy. Um, so easy. Two minute For them, for you. Yeah. And then the angst and then all this other stuff comes out. And then five weeks ago you did this and four months ago you did that. They don't remember what they did yesterday. And mm. you're bringing up things that happened, you know, seven months ago and six months ago. S- nip it in the bud straight away. Yep. Talk about it. And have a really open uh, team communication so I always say to your team is if you're a leader my door's always open if there's trouble come to me straight away don't go running telling people don't ring people on the phone and say take my side don't because then at team meetings the angst is there you know when mum and dad have had a fight mm. and you run downstairs the fight's over but mm. they cut like a knife that air and tension well in the team it's the same if there is tension in the team the fight's over. No one mm. said anything. But you all sit around the table and you feel that tension mm. like you felt when mum and dad had that fight and you walked in at the end of it. Mm. Is another <laughs> advice from me. <laughs> I love it. Uh, when you get advice, mm. get advice from, like have one or two people in your life yeah. that you trust to get yeah. advice from. Don't just go around getting advice from no. different people. Even if most people that will give you advice have the best intentions, mm. They, just because they don't know what's like, what exactly is going on, a lot of times you might end up getting the wrong advice. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you might get the wrong advice because the intentions are not right. 
uh, but even if the intentions are right, that advice might not be quite good. So find that person you trust, uh, not just trust to tell them about things, but trust uh, for the wisdom. We're those two people, aren't we? They can come to us. <laughs> we're like, yeah, great. Right. We're the new advice. 1300. Yeah, 4826. Hi, call, I've got a caller here for you. Right? Her name's Louise, and she's got a problem. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, cool. It is so true. Yeah. Find your child and don't, yeah, the more people you ask, the more confused you get with advice. Yeah. And if you're honest and open all the time with people, I say, just be honest mm. and say it nicely. You don't need to be angry with someone if you're having a problem with them. Mm. Just say how you feel. Mm. Totally. Let's go into learning and development. Oh, I love this. Uh, you, you, you obviously have a lot of uh, experience um, in learning and development. Yeah, I love it. So I think you're the right person <laughs> to talk to. <laughs> Insert Grizz into L and D. Yeah, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> so can I ask you before we get into yeah. that, what is your favorite way of learning? <gasps> well, this is the thing. I love to learn by chatting. So yeah. I'm a chatter and I love watching videos. So I'm a yeah. really and and uh, to take you back a step on that question, we have what we call the VARC adult learning principles. So what that suggested, it used to be the VAC, again, some more data for you. Mm. It used to be the VAC, which was visual, yep. auditory and kinesthetic learners, like the touchy-feely ones. Then they added the read and write learners, so the VAC became the VAC adult learning model. Right. And it's so important because we have a preference of learning. So mine yep. is that visual, auditory discussion. Mm. I, I hate reading. Mm. Like I'm not a reader. I, I try and read and I just don't get it. I have to have someone talk with me. Yep. And talk through me with it. Whereas someone like you, how do you like to learn? Honey, what's your way? I so a lot of people ask me, why did you start a podcast? And I was like, one of the reason, one of the main reasons is that's how I learn. Yeah. I learn by talking to people. Yep. Um, I can. I love watching videos as well. Like you know, I'm on YouTube all mm. the time, mm. primarily watching other people who are good at a specific thing that I want to learn about, and yep. I, I hear, you know, their views on it. Yeah. Um, but the best way for me to learn is by picking a topic that I want to learn about and talking about it to someone else. Yeah. And getting like getting firsthand uh, insights from them about it. But I acknowledge also that this is not like a full complete way of learning. Like for me, learning is like two, three things put together. Mm. Like I'm like you, I can't read books. No. There's no way, like, no. I just, when, w I've got a few books over here. Yeah, no, no. I'm not sure if you can see on the camera. Is there a Grey's Anatomy one? Because people I'm tell me to read that and I'm not. By the way, I don't know why, we're just like off topic real quick, Start With Why yeah. is one of the best books I've yeah. ever read in my life. Yep. Simon Sinek That's so is good. a legend. Yeah, he is. Um, I haven't read it, I listened to it. Mm. It was an audiobook, and it was a game changer for me. Yeah. So yeah, listening, uh, watching, but interacting with people, talking to them. And sometimes as you talk, uh, you start to discover things. You do. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's for me learning. Yeah. I'm the same. And so when we are developing training programs, we have to think that every learning style is going to be in our room. Mm. So we have to ensure that we've got the visual component for the visual learners. Mm. We've got to ensure that the auditory learners, and it's interesting because if you're watching how people learn, auditory learners often will shut their eyes because they'll want to get rid of everything that's around them mm. and just focus on what you're saying or yep. what the podcast is saying. Um, they'll look up to the sky and they'll look down the ceiling again. So we yep. have to ensure that for the auditory learners, we do, and we do podcasts uh, yep. for our training programs as well for people like awesome. you yeah. that want to learn that. Um, the kinesthetic, the doing learners, we've got to let them do stuff. So mm. it's really, really important that in any training program, if you are designing one, that your team are doing things. Now, when I talk about doing things, you might say to me, oh, Grizz, they don't want to do stuff. They don't want to do role plays. Well, nor do I. I'm not a role play girl. But even getting them to think about something, think about a time when, write down the number five. Mm. Okay, now you've written down the number five. We're going to do five things today that talk to blah. So getting them to even just be active sitting mm. is important. And whenever I do keynotes, and I do a lot of uh, keynotes around the world, well, not so much around the world anymore, but we did. And, and on stage, I'd always make yep. people do things, even sitting in their chair. Yep. I want you to think about a time when... 
look at this picture. What does that take you back to? Think about that. So that is them learning already and yep. actively doing something. So that's what we do for the kinesthetic learners. And mm. the read and write ones, we ensure that there is a manual there mm. that they can read and write with. Because the read and write learners, yep. they learn by writing everything down. So if you're ever in a, a conference, you'll yep. notice that some people just write copious amounts of notes. Yeah. And in their head, they're like, I've got these notes forever and I'm going to put them by my bedside table and read them. Mm. They never look at them again because they've learned why they've been writing. That's been their process of learning. Mm. So learning and development is an amazing function and it's a function that in most companies people put aside, yep. yet it's the most valued or should be most valued function because your teams can only be great if you train them well and teach them. Yeah, and I guess the key aspect here is to, is, is making it personalised because no, no. no one learns the same way. They don't. So you've yeah. got to personalise everything. Whereas if I go back to my school days, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everyone used to learn. We Indeed. had to, we had to yeah. learn the same way. Mm. You know, yeah. it was just like things uh, are so different now. Yeah, yeah. Even on Zoom, I mean, we've had to learn now on Zoom. We're doing so many training programs mm. on Zoom, and it's become a really different way. And some people are Zoom fatigued and working that you can't do a learning day that's eight hours on Zoom. Mm. So we've got to change that. How do you fit a program into you know forty five minutes to an hour and a half? Uh, and it's yeah, it's challenging. And yet it's fun because you see people walk away inspired. And if you can inspire people to want to do something from what you've taught them, then your program's been a huge success. Speaking of Zoom fatigue, some people uh, <laughs> actually show up but not show up to yeah, the Zoom do. course. All like the they time. put like the screen mm. background of them, like a photo of them. I know. <laughs> yeah, they do all that crazy stuff, but I get them on. Like it's yeah. interesting. Um, and here's another bit of data for you because, again, I, yeah. I'm listening to you. 7 Eleven principle, and I'm not talking Slurpees. And I'm right. not talking the convenience store open 24-7. Yeah. I'm talking in the first seven seconds, there are 11 things judged about you. Really? Truly. So uh, uh, there's so much data on this. So how do you want to be judged in the first seven seconds? Now, the way you walk into somewhere, the way you hold yourself, people mm. judge your confidence instantly. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, she's confident or she's not by the way she walks in. Look at the clothes she's wearing. We'll judge her job. Mm. Look at her. Na I mean, my name is Grigina Marita Fechner. Mm. Right, and as I said to you, I, I, I sound like a penicillin. But <laughs> when I go into a new company and they don't yeah. know me and they've never seen me, yeah. they come out to reception and they look for an old Italian woman about eighty with a bun in her hair and glasses because they think that's what a Grigina Marita Fechner yeah. should look like. So you're judged on your name, you're judged mm. on how you look, you're judged on confidence of how mm. you walk in, you're judged on the way you sit in an interaction, on eye contact. So with that Seven Eleven principle, that Zoom fatigue, the minute someone puts their photo up and won't even turn their camera on, you're being judged because people go, well, they're not interested, they're not engaged. Mm. Now, there might be a million reasons why that camera's not on. Maybe there's a kid in the background having a, a crazy heart attack. Maybe yeah. there's banana on the Doing floor. Doing backflips Maybe or something. the husband's naked, you know. So we judge all this stuff yeah. before we know anything. So I say to someone, um, do not judge mm. until you speak to someone because you don't know what's going on in their world. And uh, mm. the clothes they might be wearing may be overalls with paint, but they may have just gone and painted the Wollongong PCYC mm. for a boxing club for homeless kids yep. before they've come to meet you. Absolutely. So understand their world, mm. their needs, their wants and their desires and only then make an, a story uh, yep. and judge them on it. Amazing. Mm. Uh, and finally, mm. uh, can we talk a little bit about uh, front and centre? Uh, oh, really? Your, yeah, just oh like, God, yeah, just give us a couple promotion. of minutes. A couple of minutes, like, no. um, you know, obviously a lot of people know about it for anyone who doesn't. Lots of people what, don't. What do you guys do? <laughs> um, how do you help different companies? Yeah. If you help individuals, yeah. um, how can they reach out to you? LinkedIn, all yeah. that yeah. jazz. Oh my gosh. Uh, front and centre. 15 years ago, I was working in the pharmaceutical industry in oncology, yep. haematology, metastatic breast and bowel cancer. And I spent my life working in hospitals trying to find how to give people more life. Yep. Uh, you know, And I got to the point where I was in chemo wards every single day and we were talking to patients about extending their life by three months by having a particular tablet. Mm. And one day I was driving home and I'm just like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And the way that we're being trained in oncology it has to be done differently and better because this is really tough work. Mm. So I was driving home and I just thought, I'm going to start my own company and do it better. Mm. And it was that, I mean, it was that crazy and that simple. So 15 years ago, um, Cameron Reid, who also worked in um, a pharmaceutical company, we joined Families and Forces and decided that we'd start front and centre. And we literally started with one gig. We left wow. everything. My husband uh, was in Iraq training police in southern Baghdad. I had a, at that 
point nine year old daughter or something yeah. strange. Cameron had um, one baby just born and a one year old. So we were just we left everything for what we didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. But it's that belief and that passion that you had that got yep. us through. So fifteen years on, our company has evolved and we have a team of people around the countryside Ooh. and we do everything from um, sales programs, ones that we can make to personalise for your sales interactions. Yep. We do presentation skills. Um, train the trainer type skills, right. influencing, media training, negotiation, the you name lot. it. We do the gamut. We do a lot of product training as well. How to start a podcast. How <laughs> to start a podcast. We do um, yeah, a lot of um, medical training as well. So we spend a lot of time in the medical fraternity and I train and coach doctors, mm. number one on the public speaking circuit on how to talk to people about results, yep. how to talk to a patient. And I yep. spend most of my time sitting in front of doctors saying you have to deliver these results to your patients you need to do it better than what you're doing it because you're mm. not doing a very good job. And doctors don't claim to be great communicators. I teach doctors how to present data to media so that when we see data on our TVs, we understand it as a lay person yep. because they turn around and talk about intention to treat versus per protocol, population, inclusion, exclusion criteria. And you're like, hang on, stop, buddy. Just say to us what's happening. Like, just be <laughs> real about it. Um, so we do a lot of stuff in the communication space. We yep. do personalised coaching. We do leadership development. We do all of the stuff for Channel 9 leadership training. We do, we do a heap of stuff. If you want to master communication, yeah. In other words, <laughs> yeah, you got a Grigina to and Fonda Center. And we'll find out. Yeah, Grizz, Cam, JL. We've got a whole team. Heidi, Rishat, we've got a heap of them. And we're all as aces each other. And I love what I do. I'm so bloody lucky. Can I say swear? I'm bloody yeah, lucky. Yeah, it's fine. I'm bloody lucky. It's on YouTube. So, so oh. and, and we say... Um, when I when I upload the videos, that uh, it might include a couple of uh, yeah, just the B words. naughty words. Yeah, I haven't sw- said the bad word yet. That's I haven't right. said S or other words. No. Um, but I am. I'm genuinely lucky, and it's for people like you. You know, I think people should support each other, and I'm one for supporting anyone I can, and I'll do anything that anyone asks because I know that the support we got when we started was what got us 15 years on of still being a hugely successful company. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. It has Thank been you. my the pleasure's all mine. Have me back. Oh, I don't know, maybe. Of course, <laughs> I'd love to. Not. But we'll come back for another we episode. Should, we should do a stuff. segment. I don't know Why if don't like we? you have a lot of time yeah, let's do a in segment. your month, but yeah. we can do like a monthly segment. That Imagine would be amazing. That. We could do live TV. I do live TV cooking shows. Try and stop me live TV. Cooking? Anything. You lost me at cooking. <laughs> <laughs> and dress. I don't know note. anything about cooking. I can chuck a piece of beef on the, on the barbie, but that's about it. Um <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I think it's an art. I really do. I think cooking is an art. It is. I just, I just, I don't have it in me. Okay. Like you know, it's 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 very hard for me. But um, I think I think we should do like a monthly segment where we, you know we talk about similar topics yeah. and you know beforehand we get fr- I get from my audience, you get yeah, from your audience uh, questions and yeah. we we go through them. We might even do live stream sometimes. Well, we could do anything. Try and stop us. We're unstoppable. <laughs> For Thanks anyone, for listening. yeah, for anyone watching, listening, listening, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Grizz been fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so much, Absolutely. and look forward to doing this again. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye.